Welcome to week 12 of RELS Religious Studies 357. This is the last uh, week on global climate change as one way of envisioning the end, um, the end of perhaps human life on Earth or and other kinds of life on Earth. Perhaps even a kind of end that brings up uh, the apocalyptic, the sense of destruction of all things. Uh, and, and that's uh, something I talked about last week, but this week I want to look at a particular angle um, on this, which is uh, how climate change and the end are viewed by scientists and religious leaders. So I just finished a book, Negotiating Science and Religion in America, and uh, when I was looking at the at the, when I was looking at how to finish the book, I, I thought of what are some of the most important topics at the engagement of religion and science? And um, I recognized that probably the most important topic is climate change. There are many in the field of science and religion that see this, global climate change, as the issue for science and religion, the issue for what is particularly trending. Every year I go to a conference um, uh, on the American, at the American Academy of Religion with about 10,000 scholars of religion, theology, the Bible, etc. Um, and as they have a particular part of that uh, meeting, I, I'm a co-chair for science, technology, and religion. And as people talk about key issues, the issue of global climate change is one of the most important. So I'm, I make this statement in the slide. Increasingly, scientists and religious leaders are seeing the potential that global climate change could bring about an end to life as we know it. And they're not only sensing the need to respond, but are leading humankind to take action. So um, I want to just review a couple of key parts of this. That anthropogenic or human-caused climate change is what we're talking about, that it is human action, especially the development of um, CO2 that has caused greenhouse gases to collect in the atmosphere to change uh, the climate of our globe. And um, there are a variety of scientific leaders, if you look in the content folder for this week, that uh, I want you to be sure to look at, um, especially from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, and their uh, campaign, How We Respond. So this consensus that science has come to in terms of global climate change and how scientists are responding. Um, so that's that's definitely one side. And, and I want to get to the religious side in just a minute, but it's really interesting that there's this deep a irony that uh, anthropologists, as one form of scientists, have pointed out that Homo sapiens, in other words, our species, is perhaps the most powerfully intelligent species on the planet, and yet we will not exist as long as other hominin ancestors. Homo erectus stretches over 1.5 million years, uh, dwarfing the 400,000 years of our own species. Um, the National History Museum in London has remarked this about Homo erectus, quote, we begin to appreciate their ability to survive over a long period marked by many changes to the environment and climate, end of quote. So um, that's, the, that's the first uh, place I want to just pause and put a, a little bit of a pin in is to say that those who study science and religion see that as uh, religious leaders look at the science, many are saying, we need to do something. And one of those thinkers is Philip Clayton, um, who particularly has addressed this in an article he wrote, Seizing an Alternative. Um, it's online in the Interfaith Observer, and I, you can see how to find it. He says this, when a person of faith realizes the severity of the global climate threat, she can and should turn to the resources of her own religious or spiritual tradition. The same inner transformation that rabbis and roshis, that's Zen Buddhist masters, seek to foster in their followers can be a reorientation away from our addictions to comfort and consumerism. And the same social transformation that the prophets and the spiritual teachers emphasize becomes a call to heed the suffering of those most impacted by the deteriorating environment. 
isn't Jesus's observation a kind of social gospel? Whatever you did for one of these, one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And so um, in his book, Clayton's book, Religion and Science, the Basics, he talks about the future of science and religion um, in the same way that I did. I looked toward the future. He looked at the future and found different ways that science and religion can work together. And in the environmental crisis, he find, found the most significant examples. Uh, here again, he writes this. There is overwhelmingly strong scientific evidence that human activities, such as the release of greenhouse gases, are fundamentally changing weather patterns on this planet. Um, current models suggest that the effects of a continuing increase in greenhouse gas emissions, especially if they move toward 600 parts per million, will have catastrophic consequences for the global environment. The models suggest the models suggest that the effects of those changes could last a thousand years or more. I personally find the case so overwhelming that teaching and speaking on climate change has risen to the very top of my religion science work, says Clayton. Um, and uh, here he says, this is where science and religion can particularly work together. Um, so unlike other areas where he he sees that uh, there's not necessarily such a natural division of labor here there is religions are not in the position clayton writes to predict the melting state of the polar ice cap sorry the melting rate of the polar ice cap or to calculate how many meters the sea level will rise as a consequence only scientific models can work out the precise consequences for the planet of differing different levels of greenhouse gases being released into the atmosphere by contrast, scientists are, frankly, not particularly good at motivating ordinary citizens to change their action. Science can explain empirical relationships and causes, but reciting the facts often leaves people cold, as those who work with data know only all too well. Yet science's weakness is precisely religion's strengths. For centuries, religions have played crucial roles in influencing their followers' beliefs about right and wrong and motivating them to live differently in the world. So uh, that's the uh, end of quote there. And then Clayton goes on to talk about a few of these particular uh, religions, which I'll emphasize again here. The three Ab Abrahamic faiths go back as far as we saw uh, this in his book to the book of Genesis, which calls believers to cultivate and care for the earth. For Jews, Christians, and Muslims, nature is not a lifeless or mechanical thing, a mere compilation of matter and motion, but a creation of God and therefore a thing of great value. As a result, believers in God have every motivation to protect it, protect it from destruction, especially destruction at their own hands. Indeed, the doctrine of sin provides a way of conceiving what it means not to carry out that responsibility. And then Clayton continues, The Eastern religions are, if anything, even more oriented to treat the surrounding world as a thing of value. Earlier we, we in the book, but uh, we could just say, there's a call to compassion in Buddhism. The central Buddhist call, in fact, is a call to compassion for all sentient beings. A Buddhist environmental ethic is thus central to the entire Buddhist life way. Um, and then he observes further that Hindus and Jains recognize a soul in all living things. The process of reincarnation for Jains and Hindus includes not only human beings, but Atman or Jiva of all living things, thus caring for the earth and preserving the environments on which other living things depend remains at the center of these tradition. This holds even more for African, Native American, and under other indigenous religious traditions. Tribal peoples knew themselves to exist in an intimate balance of receiving and giving with the animals and the environment around them. And then uh, Clayton finishes with this. I saw a partnership, partnership of religions in action at the World Parliament of Religions five-year meeting at Melbourne, Australia in December 2009. The thousands and thousands of religious leaders from around the world who convened for this summit meeting had, a chose, had chosen climate change and climate justice as one of their core themes. Clayton writes that he had the privilege of organizing three sessions on science, spirituality, and global climate crisis. And the Nobel laureate Peter Doherty opened that session by putting out the, what we know about science and the causes of climate change and the likely trends. And then Clayton writes this. 
The sense of shared partnership and com common cause was palpable. I had never had heard before such a powerful culminating case, or sorry, cumulative case for environmental justice. Nor was I the only one. You could see in the faces of the hundreds of religious leaders who were in the audience, who were in the audience, they were powerfully influenced by this combination of scientific facts and religious motivations. Although all the partnerships envisioned in this section are important, this one considered here is may, maybe the most important of all. Even if all the other collaborations fall through, even if religion and sciences continue to clash over beliefs and worldviews, a successful partnership in staving off centuries-long climate catastrophe will be enough to make the entire effort of putting religion and science together worthwhile. And so I close there uh, in terms of how to bring religion and science together in this potentially and often apocalyptic scenario which science describes of, our, of the global climate crisis.